order. You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man. More former footballers have come forward to tell this programme they were sexually abused by youth coaches in the game. Most of the claims still involve the former Crew Alexandra youth coach, Barry Burnell. But there are fears that paedophiles may have preyed on youngsters at other clubs. We'll be speaking exclusively to two more <coughs> former players who've waived their anonymity to tell us they were abused as children. Keith Doyle has more. With each day, more former players are coming forward to tell their stories of alleged abuse by football coaches when they were youngsters. At the centre of the allegations is Barry Bennell, a former coach at Crew Alexander in the 80s and 90s, who served three separate prison sentences for abusing young boys. Last week, the former Crew player, Andy Woodward, broke his silence to tell of the abuse he suffered at the hands of Bennell. And this morning, two more former youth players will tell the BBC's Victoria Derbyshire programme their stories of alleged abuse by the same coach. These allegations are sending shockwaves through British football, with claims that hundreds of youngsters could have been affected and questions over how many coaches may have been involved. This morning, another unnamed player has told The Guardian newspaper that he was abused by a different coach while he was in the youth training programme at Newcastle. Northumbria Police is investigating. A hotline set up by the NSPCC yesterday received more than 50 calls within hours of opening. The England captain Wayne Rooney, who is an ambassador for the charity, has encouraged others who have been affected to come forward, saying they don't need to suffer in silence. Keith Doyle, BBC News. Uh, we are going to talk to uh, four men in just a moment or two, uh, two who've already spoken publicly about abu the abuse they suffered at the hands of their former youth coach at Crew Alexandra, and two more men who are speaking for the first time today about the abuse that they experienced as young boys. Um, thank you to those of you who are getting in touch. This viewer says, my son was in academies for all of his school life at Premier League and Championship clubs. The clubs have such a hold on the young boys <coughs> that the boys and indeed the parents will do anything to make sure they are still in favour. It is all about not being released at the end of each season. This is a breeding ground for abuse when one side has so much power over the young boys. And this message from Wendy, it is so brave of these men to come forward. Living with that awful secret must have been hell. This morning, how widespread was historical sexual abuse in football? Three former youth players exclusively tell us about the abuse they say they suffered at the hands of their former coach, Barry Burnell, a convicted paedophile. Since Andy Woodward told us last week in his first broadcast interview that he'd been raped hundreds of times by Burnell whilst at Crew Alexandra, in total, six other players have now come forward to waive their right to anonymity. And we can speak to three of them now. Chris Unsworth says he was raped between 50 and 100 times by Burnell at Manchester City and Crew youth teams. He didn't tell a single person about the abuse for over 30 years until, in fact, he saw our interview with Andy Woodward last week. Jason Dunford says he was abused once by Bunnell at the Manchester City youth team, and when he told him to get off, Bunnell effectively forced him out of the club. Neither of them turned professional, in part, they say, because of Bunnell's abuse. They're both speaking publicly for the very first time today. Steve Walters says he was repeatedly abused by Bunnell whilst at Crewe. This is his first TV interview. And with them is Andy Woodward, the player whose revelations have inspired others to speak out at last. As you'd expect, our conversation with them is going to be frank, it's going to be open, and it will cover details of sexual abuse. Um, first of all, let me thank you so much for coming on the programme today. We really, really appreciate you talking to our audience. Chris, I'm going to start with you. Uh, when you first watched the interview with Andy uh, last week, what effect did it have on you? A massive effect, really. Um, just watching Andy um, on TV, I was um, just at home with my uh, with my girlfriend, who actually watched the TV um, interview and brought it home. Um, and we sat down and watched it. I didn't say anything apart from I knew Andy. I I used to play with Andy. Um, <coughs> we had a little chat. She asked me if I was okay, then I came home and I sat at home um, 
and thought about this and I thought I've got to come forward got to come forward and help everybody you um, had never told a soul no never told anyone kept it locked away right in the back of my head and still I'm reliving things having a chat with the boys mm. and reliving it no never told a soul you were first introduced to Benel when he was a scout at Manchester City how did his abuse of you begin it, it began um, he used to he used to pick me up I was probably one of the the closest lads that lived to his house mm. in the Peak District. in the Peak District yeah. um, he used to pick me up and the abuse started in the car he used to touch we used to play games in the car and that's when it all started mm. And that would be on the way to training? On the way to training and on the way back. Right. And then he invited you to stay over at his house? Yeah, that happened a little bit later, but not long um, after. Um, at first there was, you know, two, three, four um, lads that used to stay there. And there was always two or three in the bed. Right. And I'm going to ask you, Chris, what he did to you. Uh, at first it started, you know, the games used to start and it was hands everywhere, then down the pants. And then later it got more serious um, in the bedroom where there was penetration, things like that. And what age were you? I was about nine and what did you as a little boy think was going on i didn't know what was going on to be fair i just i knew where i wanted to get and i thought this is obviously what i've got to go through did you know it was wrong what he was I doing did. was wrong i knew it was wrong but i just went with it mm. just went with it did you ever consider telling a friend, a teammate, another adult? No, never. Why? It just wasn't the in thing to do. It just wasn't the in thing to do. And you set your, you, you set your goals where you want to get to. And it was never brought up, never. He stopped after a few years, as you got older, sort of 13, yeah, 14. When you, when you get a bit older and you, you know you're, you're growing up, you're a young adult, your body changes. That's when your time really is it with him. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Move on to fresh blood, as, it's, as they say. Mm. To younger boys, effectively. Yeah, to younger boys. When you got to 15, 16, you turned your back on football? I did, yeah. I turned my back on football and I was lucky, saying lucky is that the right word. I had other sports to pursue and I turned professional golfer. So I had a, a sight and I had a goal mm. and that was my escape route. Right. And you turned your back on football because you associated it with this Horror. Yeah, somebody asked me that yesterday. At the time, I don't know. Was I good enough? I don't know. Mm. Looking back, I'd say yes. I probably turn football. I just had enough. Mm. That was it. I can't imagine what it's like for a young boy growing up through adolescence into adulthood. And for decades, keeping this kind of cataclysmic secret. No, I I chatted with my friend the other night about this, and you just get on with your life, and you forget everything that has happened. As I say, luckily I had my golf to go to, mm. and that guided me through. I think, but both my 
both my parents have died. And that hurts me. Yeah. Not telling them. Does it? Yeah. But I don't know if it's a good thing that I did or I didn't tell them because they would have blamed themselves. So. Mm. Chris, thank you for telling us. Yeah. Such, I mean, such personal, intimate, and also horrific details. I want to bring in Steve, if I may. Um, I wonder, Steve, what the effect on you has been of of revealing this secret. It's, it's, it's been like a massive relief after seeing Andy, how brave he's been last week. You know, the the, the article in the the Guardian. I, I brought. I was in the house on my own. I read it. I was inconsolable. I thought it was kind of a panic attack because it, 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 it was virtually the same scenario as me, mm. and it's it just. Somehow picked the phone up and phoned the, the newspaper because I was that hungry, upset, and but in, in another way, it was like the biggest. Like I said to Andy, it was like like a hundred tons left off off my shoulders. Really? Yeah, because to carry, you know, I've been carrying this all my life. You know, my career has been ruined. My relationships have been ruined. And like, you know, it's, uh, just as I had to get it, get it out there because, you know, I've got, you know, I've got children. I could, this could never ever happen to any more children. Mm. You, you, know. you had a reputation as being one of the finest young footballers in the country as a teenager. That's right. Yeah. You know, people say to me, you know, you know, what happened to you, Steve? In like, in a football environment. It's full of bravado and men, and like you know, we, we've all met last night, you know, and our, our stories, and you know, it's, we're, we're all the same. Mm. I, I can't believe how, how brave we, we, you know, we've all been there, and it's just. It's you just, think he he effectively snatched your footballing career away from you? Well, yeah, yeah, that's that, 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 well, that's what happened. Yeah. You know, as simple as that. You know, what's disappointing me really is like for Alexandra. You know, I come from Plymouth, and you know, my, my dad's dead now, but he ended up working at Crew as well. And you know, my parents put the trust into that football club, and basically they've let us, they've let us down, mm. all of us. Can you explain to our audience, Steve, why you were afraid to tell anyone? I've always had, I've had, I've, I've had problems with relationships with men because I've, I've always thought that I've always thought, you know, am I gay? You know, what's happened to us? Is it, it, you know, he's made he's made us feel like that. Mm. You know, that, that, that that's not right. You know. It's affected all every single relationship I've had with anybody. Like, but it's just it's it's, it's just so hard to explain. It's mm. just it's so difficult, honestly. In the early nineties, the police did talk to you, didn't they? When they yes. when they started to investigate Barry Burnell, they, yeah, that's they correct. Yeah, they, asked they, you. they come they come to my house for, mm. on three separate occasions, mm. and you know, my, my career was. You know, I got told that I was never going to play football again. Mm. So, you know, f f somehow I managed to carry on. And I, I ended up playing in the, the conference for Norfolk Victoria. But, you know, I still wanted that dream of, of trying to. I wanted to fight this and beat this. Mm. And, 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 you know, if I did come out, it wouldn't. You know, it, would people believe you? Would people? You know, back in that day and age, you. If you come out with this sort of accusations, so, so to speak, w would anybody believe you? And would you get the support that we've had at the moment? Mm. You, you know, you, back then you just did not know. No. Um, I'm going to read some messages from our audience this morning. Are you all right, Andy? Yeah. yeah. I'm okay. I'm just a bit emotional. I'm yeah. all right. All right. Okay. I'm fine. Um, Katie says, "I want to praise these high-profile footballers 
for coming forward and being so brave to speak openly about the terrible things that happened to them. I hope it will help bring the culprits to justice. Uh, tweet from Sue says, uh, watching Victoria live, four brave men on the programme today. This from Sue, my heart goes out to these men right now. It takes incredible courage to speak to anyone about this, let alone tell the nation. Roxy says, incredible bravery being shown by the footballers on your programme. The absolute epitome of courage, and my heart goes out to them. This from Stephen, really brave men. Thank you all for your courage, guys. I mean, there are, there are so many of these. They're, tweet from David, absolutely essential. These football abuse survivors get access to talking therapy individually or as a dedicated group. Uh, Victor says, respect for the courage of these men. I think in your case, Steve, uh, similar to Andy, similar to Chris, actually, Barry Bunnell was saying to you, you know, I'll get you there. I'll, I'll, I, you stick with me, I'll get you playing for England. That's correct, yeah. He's, he's made all these false promises and, you know, he, had, he was such a... He had character, he, his coaching skills were something that we'd never seen in this country before, you know. Mm. To think he, he could do things with the football we'd never seen before. In these, so uh, I, you know, I can, I can produce that into the game and show you these tricks and flicks, and mm. you know, he, he promised you this, he promised you that, but it's, it's just all, it was just all grooming, wasn't it? Since you spoke to the Guardian early this week, Steve, do you think you've had enough support from footballers? from the football world, from ex-pros who are high profile? Have you had enough support from those kind of people? I'd, I'd like a little bit more, really. It was a lot of high profile teammates who are out there, but still think there's, there's this bravado thing in football that needs to be, you know, be sorted out now because, you know, it's, it's okay. They, you know, they were successful in their careers and you know, we, we've all had our lives and careers snatched away from, from us, you know, mm. we, we, we all need the support from anybody and everybody out there. Mm. Um, clearly, in your case, Steve, in your case, Chris, you're speaking about this for the first time after all these decades, so your, what happened to you was not part of the evidence against Bunnell when he was jailed in the late 90s. What do you want to happen now? Want just justice now, you know, the, the, the thought of Barry Bernal being out on the streets. For example, coming down here last last night, our train was unfortunately terminated at Milton Keynes, and apparently that's, that's where he is. And, you know, we had to get off the train at night. I was saying to my wife... <laughs> You know, he could, he, he could he could be he could be, you know, here now. You know, it's just just want, want justice and you know, like closure on here on on here now. You know, yeah. we, if, if, if all this has got it's got to be rectified as, as soon as possible. I'm going to bring in Jason, if I may. Um, thank you, Steve. <sighs> Jason, compared to Andy, Steve and Chris, you describe yourself as lucky. Explain mm. to our audience why you say that. I feel I'm lucky because at the moment of what I, or what is determined now as sexual assault, I told him where to go. I confronted him and as I saw the boys last night, I'll never forget the deathly stare. Mm. And uh, this was in his house? No, 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 this was in a holiday camp oh, yeah. uh, at Butlins. Mm. Um, and that stare was one of, I'll never forget, I, I can never ne ever forget that stare, but from that day forward, I knew my life was going to be really difficult with this guy. Because, because you told him to, I told him to go. where to go? I told him to F off. Yeah. Um, he then started and I remember, to I remember physically, sla I remember physically hitting him, mm. um, of which there was no retaliation from the guy. Um, as a 13-year-old boy, 14, you know, nearly 14 years of age, um, I was the same as every boy in this city. Um, I had a dream of being a footballer. 
and every child who has a dream, to me, should be able to try and achieve that dream without having to go through sexual abuse or being around sexual predators. Barry Burnell, to me, was um, not only a dangerous man, and he's, he still is a dangerous man, but most of the lads that were involved in his coaching and being involved in the squads that he coached over the years um, will find this very difficult and hopefully by what's going on we're going to get some results. Mm -hmm. When you told him where to go he mm -hmm. then started the mind games he would tell you he was going to play you then he was going to drop you yeah, yeah, yeah. then you turn up at games on a Sunday your mum would drive however many miles to yeah, take yeah. you there and you'd be standing on the sidelines and never get on yeah. and that that was the start of him trying to isolate you. What else did he do, Jason? Yeah, he, he detached me from the group mm. by um, playing mind games with me. But like the lads have said, because you're following a dream, you prepare to go through with it. The difference and why I feel different to these, these lads is that I wasn't prepared to put up with that. I love the game of football. I thought to myself, there's other ways around this. Barry Bennell isn't the be-all and end-all of getting me to where I want to go. And if we have to go around the houses, I'll go to another team, I'll try something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Because as he's tried to detach me from the group by fabricating stories of me amongst my, my teammates... Um, well, he said that you'd stolen money from yeah, one yeah, of your yeah. teammates, didn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He took us down to Norfolk for a Canary Cup tournament which at the time my father was, you know, a working class man who, who had to pay for this trip. Mm. Um, and as it usually was, we'd come home with a trophy and there was no trophy. The team had been uh, dropped, um, the team had been defeated. Um, and my father just said to me, well, why haven't you played? I said, well, and it's, do you really want to tell your parents that you've been accused of being a thief? Mm. Do you really want to be that? Mm. Um, I had to make up and fabricate the story to my parents. It mustn't, in my mother's head, um, she was just looking at the football side of it. Like every single parent mm. that, that worked hard, that brought the children, run about the country with this man, yeah. bringing the children to the football. And I think um, for those parents out there who are kicking themselves, don't be guilty. Mm. Do not be guilty because this man was playing games with not only the children's heads, he was playing games with the parents' heads as well. Let me read some more messages uh, before we pause for the news and sport, but Black mm -hmm. Rev says this on Twitter, to every one of those guys sitting on the sofa this morning, just know that millions of people are supporting you. Rachel says, such bravery of the guys on your programme, massive respect to them for coming forward and speaking up. Kayla says, this is absolutely heartbreaking seeing these grown men talk about what's happened to them as children. True courage. Lucia, former footballer, discuss discussing the abuse claims is heartbreaking. Speaking out about abuse is vital. And there are more which I'll read in a few minutes or so, and then I'm going to bring in Andy. But this morning, good morning, by the way, we are talking to Chris Unsworth, to Jason Dunford and to Steve Walters, three men who've spoken about the abuse they experienced as young boys, footballers, loving the game of football by coach, their coach, Barry Burnell, a convicted paedophile. Uh, Chris and Jason speaking publicly for the very first time today. Steve, uh, in his first TV interview, has explained what happened to him. And all of them have spoken because of what Andy Woodward did a week ago. Andy is here too and is very emotional, which is completely understandable. But I want to ask you guys, if Andy hadn't spoken out, would you have ever come forward? Not, not in a million years, you know, I, I keep telling Andy this, he, he, what he's done is, is so brave, inspirational, it's, you know, it, it, in our, well, my opinion, in our opinion, for, for what, he's, what he's done now is absolutely fantastic what he's done, mm -hmm. so brave, you know, you know, I, I've been calling him, my, he's like my, my new brother, <laughs> you know. What would you say, Chris? It was locked way back in my mind and I'd forgotten about it. I would never have come forward if I hadn't seen Andy on telly. But what was it about him speaking about his experiences that inspired you to do the same? Just because 
I know what he has been through because I've been through exactly the same and all the lads have been through the same and this has got to stop and the only way that I could help is to come forward. You, you seem quite strong, Chris, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah, a lot of people have said that, but I don't know if I'm that strong, I don't know. Deep down, I don't think I am, but I'm now, I'm a funeral director, I see lots of horrible things, mm. so that's probably made me a little bit stronger than the rest of the lads. Mm. What would you say to Andy? I love Andy to bits, <laughs> and I'm here because of him. Mm. Andy, you've done a, a quite remarkable thing, you know. I was totally overwhelmed, you know. I've got... <coughs> Last week I was on here, I was on my own. And I was so scared. But I knew that they were here. I've, I've got... Honest to God, Victoria, I, I can't... I can't thank the public enough and the media. And more importantly, the, the lads for backing me up, you know. I'm just totally overwhelmed. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you all about parents, your parents, letting you stay over at a coach's house. I'd like to think that would never happen today. What was different about back then? For, from my perspective, I'll come together now. My perspective is that, I've said it before in other interviews, that the parents didn't know. Mm. They didn't know, and they are also victims in this, you know. Right. I had my mum and dad Absolutely. in tears last night because they actually realised for the first time that they're actually victims as well in yeah. this. Mm. And they are. Is it feasible that other adults at the time really didn't know what was happening? Impossible. Uh, the football clubs, I don't believe it for one minute. I believe there was a, there was a conspiracy there was a paedophile ring um, and there was people at those football clubs that had duty to look after the welfare of young boys coming through their system. This is their potential future stars and their future stars are being sexually abused and sexually assaulted by a member of their staff. Mm. Steve, what do you think? Is it possible other adults really didn't know? I, I, I don't honestly know. Um, Until Bunnell's arrest? I, I, I honestly don't know, really, to be honest with you. Chris? I think members of the club, they knew what was going on. They knew what was going on, but it was just swept under the carpet. You're talking about senior players? Senior players. Senior management? Senior management, and the top as well. Is this as big as Savile? <laughs> I, think, I think Savile looks like a choir boy compared to this fella and what's going on right now. Mm. Let me tell you. As I said, this Victoria, is so big. Yeah, as I said, so I said on um, Channel 4 last night, I'll tell you a story that this is, this is chilling, this. Mm. Somebody rang me up and said, do you remember going to Gran Canaria? And I did it myself as well. And he said, there were seven of us that went away. And he said, do you know what? We went for seven days with seven of us. And he had one every night. Oh God. Do you know why you didn't talk to each other as boys? It wasn't then? a thing to be done, was it, lads? No. no. From no. being 11 years of age, you didn't discuss things like that. Mm because the dream would have burst. Yeah. And that's just concentrated on improving football. Mm. There is one, just Victoria, yeah. that just to show you that, that this is how it was a written rule. I remember being on a train at the age of 13 and I've spoken to this lad and we, it's 25 years since he's come out and we were sat on a train and he said, do you remember, do you remember Woody, do you remember? And he looked at me and I looked at him and we both knew. Mm. And we eye contact and he said, you knew, didn't you? And I said, yeah, I knew. Mm. But the rest, it, you just, we didn't talk to each other. Mm. Could it have been prevented? Yeah. 
quiz? I think, yeah, it could have been prevented, but way back then, there was, there was no laws. No. You just went with it. You just went with it. Steve, do you think it could have been prevented? Look, looking back at it now, yeah, you know, say, like I said before, you know, I lived in Plymouth, so I, I, I had no choice to stay in. Yeah, you moved up. Yes, that's right. You know, I had, to, I had to stay somewhere. So as far as my parents were concerned, you know, they put the, the, the trust in, into the football club, mm. and surely they, they should have vetted and made sure the person that was looking after us mm. was a normal person, you know. <sighs> Could it happen now? I don't think so. Really? I don't think so. Recently I've been involved with a professional football club looking after boys our age. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the football club I worked at, um, everything is safeguarded. Everyone is protected. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a different world now. And thankfully, for our young children, mm -hmm. most of us have got children and some boys at football clubs. And um, I'm more confident now than back in the 80s mm -hmm. that this wouldn't happen. Do you want to see these historic claims of sexual abuse in football brought into the wide-ranging national child sexual abuse inquiry? difficult question that I mean what went on in the past I mean like I said to you you know all I was focusing on is now I mean if it helps to for us to all to now move forward in football that it, it's going to help safeguard and, and safeguard everyone in sport then that's fine yeah mm -hmm. um, and, and I think the issues it's funny Jason just said that I think the issues at professional football clubs it's 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 tight, it's ring-fenced. Mm -hmm. I think the problem is, in grassroots football, mm -hmm. when there's young, the, these small clubs where parents are having to be managers and they're struggling to get sort of the funding and everything else, mm -hmm. and these managers out there, it, it, it is an easy target, you know, mm -hmm. because they are struggling to get managers that mm -hmm. will look after the team. But you still have to get checks in order to, to, be, to be a coach, don't you? you? you yeah, they you take a, a, a bit of time to come through. But you're you supposed to, but yeah. when, when you know, you've not got a manager and they're really struggling to get these kids... Mm. People step play. in. But Victoria, can I just comment now? Mm. Up till 1990, whenever it was, he was first arrested. Mm. If you would have done a background check in those days, as it is today, he might have been okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because he wasn't caught. Yeah. So yeah. what we're saying is, is we've got a system in place at the moment whereby one of trust, mm. until you become an offender, which obviously carries victims, then you can get away with whatever you want to do. Mm. After Bernal's conviction in 1998 and mm. George Ormond in 2002, that's the the Newcastle United connection. As far as I can see, there was no effort made by any club or the FA to try to investigate whether there were other alleged victims, whether there were other offenders. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think of that, Chris? I just think it's shocking. Shocking. It's like everything that we've been through has been brushed under the carpet. And this is why we're here today, to bring it out and to make people aware. and. Hopefully, others will come out and join us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Steve, what do you think that, about the fact that there was no w wider inquiry from, from those within football to, to, to try to find out if others had been affected? I've got, <laughs> to be honest, I'm gob gobsmack, really. Um, all the organisations that are supposed to be responsible for, you know, for football and looking after children, they've got a a right and duty to to protect us so all the all the appropriate authorities you know down to the police everybody it, it, the whole of football just needs ripping apart and say as I said before this can never ever happen to any young footballer again 
you know, it's, you know, off us, us four, there's others who have been brave enough to come out now. It's, we're all going through a lot of pain at the moment, but if we can prevent anything else happening to any other mm. young children, you know, me personally, I'll, 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 I'll die a happy man then. I'm going to introduce you to Sarah, who's been watching you this morning. Sarah is one of our viewers. Um, uh, Sarah herself has been abused in the past. Hello, Sarah. Hello, good morning. Hi, Hi good you? morning. Um, what do you want to say to these gentlemen here this morning? Um, that looking at each, each one of you, I can see the depth of your pain, and I know what it takes to come forward. I think you're so brave. You're doing such an amazing thing for so many people and for yourselves that I hope your own pain will gradually ease and you have as many good things in your life as you possibly can. You're very, very brave and courageous. Thank you very much. You very much have me as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. Let me read some more messages. Uh, Johnny says this has to be the most emotional interview I've ever seen. These guys are the bravest men in football. Massive respect. Georgina echoes that. These men are so brave. My heart goes out to them. Uh, Adam says this story about paedophilia in football is just heartbreaking. These poor guys. Really moving testimony on sexual abuse in football today. Uh, Sarah says heartbreaking. Abuse victims need a voice. We need to be heard when we speak up. Andy, please, any footballer, come out and support these brave, brave guys who've come forward. Um, Becky, so many footy kids are being driven around by parents with no checks. Mine always has his dad with him, but many don't. What do you want to happen now, Andy? <laughs> I've, got, I've got this... Um, I've got this endeavour to, to, to go with this. <coughs> I'm, I'm not going to stop. And they have spoke to the FA, and it's a passion inside my stomach that I'm going to do everything I can to help those young kids. And, and I won't stop. It's like Steve said there. I'll, I'll, I will die a happy man now. And I'm going to do everything I can possibly to help people. And all I've ever do, all I've ever wanted in life is to help people. You know, and, and for me as well, I'm so emotional because last week I was sat in here on my own. I know I've got these guys, and I've got so many people I've worked so hard this last week. And I just encouraged, I know there's more out there, Victoria, I know there is, and they can do it. They really can do it, you know? I'm going to thank you all so much. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Andy, thank you. Chris, Steve, Jason. You have been incredibly dignified. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. And honestly, I have, uh, there are so many messages, but you'll be able to see them on, on Twitter afterwards. Um, mm -hmm. Most of them talking about your courage for speaking out on the programme today. I want to give you the 24-hour NSPCC hotline number. If you want to talk to somebody about abuse or if you want to report abuse, it's this, 0800 023 2642. This is the hotline number that was set up or that opened yesterday morning. 0800 023 2642 0800 023 2642 Thank you again. Thank you. The FA says it's urgently looking into those historical abuse claims. This morning's Guardian claims an unnamed player has also come forward to say he was abused when he was in the youth system at Newcastle. The player is the seventh footballer to publicly allege abuse over the last week. At a meeting at Wembley yesterday, the FA chair, Greg Clark, met Andy Woodward and pledged the organisation's full support to victims of child sexual abuse. I don't know how the Football Association responded at the time. I've spent most of my time trying to get up to speed on how good our measures are currently to protect the current generation of children playing and learning about football. There was no response. Well, I, I believe you. Uh, and if there was no response at the time, that, that's appalling. This is Barry Bunnell, the former Manchester City and Crew Alexandra youth coach, who all four players we spoke to this morning say abused them in the 1980s. He's been jailed three times for child sex abuse, including once in the United States. He was jailed most recently in 2015 for an historic sexual offence committed against a 12-year-old boy on a football pitch in Macclesfield. The police in Florida 
say he had an insatiable appetite for young boys. He himself descri described himself as a monster while giving evidence in court in 2015. This is him talking to the BBC back when he was a youth coach at Crewe in 1991. We really work the kids up, they're learning all the time and um, we do a lot of talking to them as well as showing them the, the skills and uh, explaining the game to them. But uh, we, we explain that there's, there's more to it than just coming here one hour a week. They need to, well, we give them homework. Bernal remains permanently suspended from football. The England captain Wayne Rooney is this morning encouraging any player who's been sexually abused during their careers to call a new dedicated football helpline so they no, no longer suffer in silence. The 24-hour NSPCC hotline number is 0800 023 2642. 0800 023 2642. We can speak now to three former players. Peter Shilton, England's most capped footballer. John Scales, former Liverpool and England defender. And Michael Bennett, former Charlton player, who's, who's now the Professional Football Association's Head of Player Welfare. Uh, John, I know you were watching the, uh, the interviews earlier with the four guys. Uh, what did you think? Well, first and foremost, I think like everybody, just the, the courage and the bravery that uh, they showed was uh, incredibly powerful and moving. Uh, the emotional... Uh, shock I think that we all felt watching that is nothing in pales into you know, comparison with, with obviously the trauma that they're going through right now in revealing uh, all that they are but years and years of living with that and locking it away and not being able to process it, not being able to get into therapy to try and go through that lengthy lengthy process that in many ways is just starting now uh, it was hard watching, very, very difficult, uh, very moving and, and I felt as a, a former professional footballer, you know, I've seen things in a dressing room, um, verbal abuse, physical abuse, you know, to hear those stories of sexual abuse and what those young players went through was, was just quite shocking and disturbing and so my heart goes out to them and my support, you know, in whichever way you feel you want to support those players and that bravery to come out. They share that experience, which is going to help them in moving forward, obviously. Um, it's a long process for them to come to terms with and the steps ahead now that they have revealed what they have. And, and I hope that you know all the authorities, relevant authorities, really come together um, and make that as a good a process as possible. And we ensure that this sort of thing doesn't ever happen again. Um, but that brings it on to the whole sort of issue of how, where does it drive paedophiles that have been prevalent in the game in the past where does it drive them into the lower reaches of the game the fear that we all as parents have about keeping our children safe um very very disturbing stories peter how do you respond well first of all um terrific respect for the for the lads there um to come out very brave to come out and uh, you know tell about the abuse I think you, you can't think of anything really worse to, to happen to you and I think hopefully by doing what they've done it's helped them a little bit because they've obviously suppressed it for years and years and years I mean and you know to, to actually get it out into the open hopefully they will gain some, some benefit from it first of all um, but I think you know it, it is a society thing you know we've seen it in so many other areas just recently entertainment in particular but it, it is a society thing but when it when it becomes into sport um, you know you, you I think we tended to turn a blind eye and and I think what happens is that you know young footballers uh, talking about football you know they they really want to be become footballers you know that when they're young they dream of it their parents dream of it and in some ways they'll they'll sort of um, you know, do, do anything in a sense to, to try and achieve that. You know, they won't want to upset coaches, they won't want to upset people at clubs. And um, obviously this is a bit of a license then for, for these paedophiles to, uh, you know, to, to um, obviously do what they want to do. And, um, you know, it hasn't been good enough in the past in terms of, you know, bringing it out and having areas where, you know, obviously coaches are checked. But, you know, as one of the, the lads said earlier on, you know, some of them, you know the checks will be will be great. It's when they actually get into the situation. Uh, what do you do then? Mm -hmm. And and all you can do is is give an area where you know the lads can actually um, or the parents can actually 
you know, ring and, and let people know what's going off. So overall, great credit to the boys and hopefully from this there'll be a springboard to a lot of other things happening. Michael, you've been involved, I know, in helping Andy and others who've been abused. Yeah. What, what, what is the nature of that help? The nature of that help is that uh, when individuals are, are, are come forward, um, we have a triage system in place that we uh, find the relevant support re recognised for them uh, and get that process underway. Uh, in Andy's case, he came onto us October last year uh, with a presenting issue and obviously going through that, that, that therapy, uh, this obviously is coming out from that mm. uh, and he's giving him the strength to now come forward and, and, and share what he's gone through with other people and uh, obviously the catalyst for Chris and, and Jason to come forward as well as, well as, as, well as Stephen, so um, yeah, that's, that was a process. Mm. Do you think it could happen now? I'm hoping not. Um, you know, with the safeguard and stuff that we've got in place now, uh, it's very, very tightly done now. So I, I honestly don't think it could happen now. Do you think? Do you think we should have in law mandatory referrals? So if you suspect as an adult anything inappropriate is going on, you should be compelled to tell somebody to report it. I think so. Yeah, I think that gives that individual. That, that freedom to be able to express what they're going through and to have a, a source to go to to do that. Mm. Uh, and I think that will make life much more easier for the individuals that are going through that experience to, to, to share what they've encountered. Right. Um, John, what do you think about that? This idea that you should be compelled by legislation if you suspect something to report it? It's all about having confidence. And I, my concern is that you've got to create an environment where people feel safe and confident that the institutional support, the institutional rigour will be there to, to back that up. And as we've seen in the, uh, the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, the chaos that that finds itself in destroys confidence that the process will be robust, that you will be believed, will, that you will be safe and, and, you know, in an environment where you can share those things in confidence. And, I, I absolutely agree that that's probably the, the right step to take, but it, it does become mandatory. Um, how that actually works in practice will have to be really well thought through and, and ensure that those victims uh, feel that they are getting the absolute adequate support in so many areas. It's not just about disclosure, it's about the support then and the confidence that they have in, in that uh, process. Stay with us, gentlemen, because in the light of uh, these revelations, we've been taking a look at what measures might be taken to keep children safe. It's the most popular game in the world. Eight million people play football in this country. But after the recent revelations of historic abuse, how vulnerable is the game today and what's being done to protect young children? My concern is, is not looking back, it's looking what we can do now and what we can do to put in place to protect these children even at grassroots. It is important that we do not ignore a single thing. From 2001, the Football Association put in place new rules. People we've spoken to say it was well ahead of other sports on this. And what if you feel the situation is more serious? Each team from the smallest to professional outfits must now have a trained safeguarding or welfare officer. Anyone who works with under 18s must have a criminal record check. That's more than 50,000 a season. Keep it safe. The FA Not says sure. this will screen out anyone who may pose a risk. Others say it's far from a guarantee. What we know about abuse is that people don't talk about it. They they don't come forward. Um, it's a it's a crime that is is covered in in silence, and so there very often isn't a a criminal record. Critics of the current system say it relies too much on children being able to come forward and report abuse. In other countries, they have stricter rules. The new portrait emerging of the Penn State football coach accused of abusing eight young boys. In the US, a senior football coach was recently convicted of 45 counts of child abuse. But three other men at the university involved, Penn State, are still awaiting trial for failing to tell the authorities about their suspicions. He too never contacted police or kept sending... Some form of that protection, called mandatory reporting, is in place in most other countries. It makes it a criminal offence not to come forward and report neglect if you have a reasonable suspicion it's going on. Introducing mandatory reporting increases um, both the number of reports but also the number of reports that are substantiated. Others, though, think mandatory reporting has its limitations and could lead to police being overwhelmed with reports of abuse that later prove false. 
The government is now considering whether to tighten the law, with the final decision due next year. Well, let's speak now to Labour's sports spokesperson, uh, Dr Rosanna Allen Khan. John Nicholson is here from the SNP. He sits on the Culture, Media and Sport Select Committee. Tom Perry is here too, an abuse survivor and campaigner who wants to introduce mandatory reporting, which you heard about uh, from Jim just then. Also still with us, three former players, Peter Shilton, uh, John Scales and Michael Bennett. Uh, Tom, mandatory reporting, why is it essential in your view? Um, well, I'm the founder of the Pressure Group Mandate now, so we're easily findable. Why is it important? Um, at the moment, we're one of the few countries in the world that doesn't have it. Um, just to give you some idea, to get the scale of all this, 72% um, of, uh, of Asian countries have it, 74% mm. of African countries have it, some form of mandatory reporting, 86% of Europe and 90% of the Americas. But apparently the government keeps telling us we've got it right. Well, quite clearly, you know, given the fact that we now have the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, we've had these extraordinary revelations in sport, we haven't got it right. So what would mandatory reporting mean in practical terms? In practical terms, um, we're, um, we're, we're following precedent that exists elsewhere, principally in Australia, I yes. have to say, where it operates so well. We want to see anyone who has a suspi suspicion on reasonable grounds mm. to report that to a triage service. Now that actually in principle is operating now in this country. The only problem is it is discretionary to report, it is not mandatory okay. to report. Okay, would the SNP support that? I'm not entirely sure how that would work. So it is, is it, uh, do well, you... Well if you had a suspicion on reasonable grounds you'd have to tell you the police. Tell... Yes, but do you have a, is, there a, is there a penalty if you don't and if so what's the penalty? Ah, now that's very interesting because yes there is a penalty and the penalty actually is a fine through magistrate's court. This is all set out in our submission um, where we drafted the legislation for the government, mm. for the government's consideration. And it is there very clearly. So okay. these matters. So, you, so you'd criminalise someone who didn't report, who had a suspicion on reasonable grounds. On reasonable grounds. Uh, yes. What happens, for example? Yes. Um, because I'm interested in your proposal. But what happens, for example, if you're talking about a 17-year-old boy uh, or an 18-year-old young adult who knows that his 15-year-old mate is being abused? Would that 18-year-old boy then be subject to criminal penalties if he himself feels intimidated no. and doesn't want to come forward? No, not at all, because that indicates that you don't quite understand the, the system that is operating in England. In England, what happens is with children under the age of 18 years old, if there is, a, if there is an offence mm. of a, of a, 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 by, a, by, a, by someone who is defined as a child under the age of 18 who is in an educational setting working in a regulated activity, because we are talking about mandatory reporting only in regulated activities, which include sport, mm. includes schools, includes faith settings. What happens is, is that that gets referred to children's services mm. and this protocol exists now and children's services address that. We're not seeking to criminalise okay. a 17 year But if you're 18, if you're 18 and in that situation you could be subject to criminal penalties. No, not, no, not, if, you're, not, if, you're, not if you're within a regulated activity because we are only applying mandatory reporting to regulated activities. I see. As defined by the Safeguarding Vulnerable Groups Act 2006. Okay. Um, uh, Rosanna, would you support that? I would. I think we need a robust, well-designed system. We have a duty to protect our so children. So we don't have people. that now is the implication We of that. don't. I don't believe that we do. I think it's, it's about two things. It's about having a robust, well-designed system, but also creating a safe space for people to come forward and say when they're concerned. But I must preface this by saying that 99.9% .9 of coaches and officials work hard. They have the children's best interests at heart. Of course, of course, of course. Of course. Yeah. Know, but, but, but we have to crack down on sexual predators. Yeah. Um, I mean, Tom, you are a survivor of abuse. Just how difficult is it to speak up? Um, when I was, um, I kept it. I kept quiet about it for a mere 38 years. Goodness. Okay. And I have to tell you, it is incredibly difficult. It is, a, it is an absolute life changer to many people. Not everybody, mm. but to me it certainly is. I have to tell you that living a life where I have no respect for authority, and to be frank with you, anyone carrying a clipboard walking towards me is in deep trouble without realizing it, mm. because it is a statement of authority, and it is a problem. And frankly, the cost of child abuse I mean, the NSPCC has done some research on this and, and estimates conservatively. I have to say we do question it, as we do rather a lot of things about the NSPCC, if I'm frank with you. Um, uh, the cost of it, they estimated in 2012, was 3.2 billion. This goes into police, court service, drug addiction, crime. 
it just get, and mental health services, yeah, yeah, of which absolutely. I have taken part of, um, I, I said to, it, it came out in a group that I was involved in, that nine, uh, seven out of nine people had been abused in childhood. I asked the principal psychologist if this was common, and they said, well, it's almost the default. Were it not for, were it not for child abuse, frankly, mm -hmm. we would have space. Mm -hmm. yeah. John Nicholson, from your committee's point of view, your chairman has written to the FA. Do you have any steer on how widespread this might be in terms of historical claims? And are you satisfied the FA is taking this seriously enough now, even if it wasn't then? Well, of course, 20 years ago, there was a dispatches programme which looked at this on Channel mm. 4, and the recommendation was that the FA should take it very seriously indeed. Mm. That was back in 1997. And they wouldn't even comment at the time. Precisely. Mm. We, now, we now know that this hotline has been set up and what, over 50 people have called it almost immediately. That was the figure yesterday. Yes, that so was on this programme it, they t in the first two hours, 50. It is clearly yeah. a, a huge uh, problem. So what our select committee has done is write to the FA, find out what the FA's action plan is. We're keen to have the FA in to speak to us about this mm -hmm. and then decide how we're going to take it forward. Because okay. enormous, it's, it's, it's obviously an enormous problem, not least because what we've heard today is what we all know from our friends and our family, from our, our, our constituents, that kids are often scared to tell their parents. They don't want to upset their parents, no, yeah. I think is a huge problem. Let me, I just want to ask our former players, um, Chris, Jason, Andy and Steve said, you know, they thought there were, there were adults who knew what was going on. I want to ask you, Michael, mm -hmm. have you heard rumours? Had you heard about suspicions? In regards to what was going on? Yeah, uh, without naming any names, obviously. When you were playing, you heard rumours. Um, and a, a number of players will say the same thing, um, but without any evidence you can't do anything. So, yes, the rumours were there, mm. uh, but as I said, no one wasn't brave enough then to step forward and, and, and come forward with those allegations. Um, and that's why we're here today, because mm. these guys are now... So the kids, kids. I'm interested in knowing that, because we've both been around the BBC for a while. There was always rumours, weren't there, about Jimmy Savile, but... but Hard evidence uh, was was quite a different thing. Yeah, well, let did, me just did, let me. Did just, the kids tell, talk to other kids? Well, I asked I, Andy, I, Steve, yes, and Chris, and Jason, and they didn't. Yeah. They, didn't they didn't talk to each other. There would be a look. They would exchange a look with their eye, yeah. purely through eye contact. Yes. But they did not speak about yeah. it. You don't. And can I tell you why? Because it's very important. Very few people mention this. Because as kids, when you are abused and the abuse is repeated, okay, it's it's a very dangerous word. This, but this is it. You feel complicit and complicity silences you. Right. right. Peter, did you, again, without naming any names, did, when, in your long and distinguished playing career, did you hear rumours? Did you hear suspicions? Were there particular clubs where players said, I think that might be going on? Um, no, not really. Not on, on, on the abuse side. It was more, I think, maybe that, you know, one or two players may be gay, um, but not on the abuse side. I, I think just here, very, very... You know, I think we've got to be very careful that, you know, when we're talking about coaches and we're talking about boys really on this, I mean, um, I, I know that there may be some adults or teenagers involved, but I think obviously the, the coaches in this country, somebody just alluded to it, that, you know, 99% or 98%, whatever percentage you want, you know, are great people who really do a great job. And, and we've got to be very careful that we, we don't stigmatise, you know, the f coaches of, of kids you know, uh, it is a very small uh, minority yeah. that do this. But, you know, I think we've obviously, going forward, we've got to make sure that the people who have been abused, who maybe feel they can come forward now, there's a, a great platform for them to get help. And these, as I say, these brave lads who have come forward will, will help in that. Job. But obviously, going, going with the, the people that, in the future, we've got to put, obviously, a lot tighter regulation in. I mean, the FA years ago is nothing like today. I mean, yeah. a lot of things were brushed under the carpet. You know, things weren't discussed. I mean, the FA now is more open. As we see, they, they put a hotline in, which is, which is somebody just said, there's 50 odd calls yesterday. So they are more progressive in this, but I think years ago, maybe it was just brushed under the carpet and it wasn't, it's not supposed to happen. Yeah. And as I said earlier on, youngsters, you know, they, they want to become football as their parents do. And it's, even if they know there's rumours, they won't want to sort of put their kid in jeopardy in case 
you know, he gets thrown out of the club or something. So there's all these things to consider. Uh, Rosanna Ali Khan, I wonder if you think these historical sexual abuse claims in football should be brought into the National Child Sexual Abuse Inquiry? I think they should. I think we need to do absolutely whatever we can to stop this happening. I mean, I'm a mother myself and I, I know up and down the country parents are going to be frightened. Children and young adults are going to be frightened about what it means for them to come out, what it means to take their child somewhere and leave them unaccompanied. And I think it's really, really important. I mean, I've, I've spoken to the FA, I've been in discussion with them already, and they have been working very, very hard recently to have designated safeguarding officers. But we need to make sure that these safeguarding officers that are quite often a parent um, have robust training. They need proper training. Mm. Um, and I would really want welcome any measures that it would take to ensure that there's a safe platform for people to come out and report. John, final thought, did you, again, without naming any names, did you hear rumours when you were playing? Yeah, I heard uh, very clear rumours. Um, and uh, the clubs that we've been discussing through, there was always, you know, uh, innuendo and things said. And, you know, we heard all the other stories and all other, the other sort of fanciful rumours about players and everything else. I did also hear rumours about players themselves, senior players, um, abusive, um, aggressive, and saw that firsthand to other players. And therefore, that was also the issue. So you, you come back the full circle that those youngsters almost grow up in an environment where they feel that this is part and parcel of playing football, being in this environment, that, as the gentleman said before, if you don't accept it, you, and, you, and the guilt you feel, and the complicity that you feel in it, feel, makes you feel compelled that that is just part and parcel of the environment in which you're in. Okay. For me, I'm scared to death of my children now, at the age of seven and ten, going off into ballet, jazz, swimming, Absolutely. athletics, wherever they are. And we look at people, look at coaches, look at those people in those positions of power and influence, with an eye of suspicion on every single one of them. And that's a horrible place to be, but that's the world in which we live in. And therefore, you know, it's, it's all well and good saying, you know, football has this problem. I think society, I think we all appreciate society has this problem of paedophiles extensively um, at large in this country and across the world. Um, and there has to be a process that's put into place that safeguards those youngsters okay. much better. I think the mandatory reporting is a good step, as long as it's Im implicated, uh, Im implemented in the right way. But I think politicians have got to be careful about sort of saying uh, all these fantastic new systems be put in without the rigour of learning the lessons and sort of passing the blame towards the FA. The FA 20 years ago is a very different organisation than the FA today. We saw the way they came out with the NSPCC and put this uh, helpline together and put that where players can come forward. My fear is that football has the resources to be able to put these into place and into action. My concern is that these minor sports with very little funding and are unable to do that. Um, and therefore, how do you, without the money or the resource of those, those other sports, do we push the files out of that tier of the game of, of football, where the money and the resources are able to look after the welfare of youngsters, and we push those predators into other areas and, okay. and we, we, we never break the cycle. Tom, very final, brief very, final word. Terribly. Very simply, 40 years ago, there's no need for anyone to report the witness rape of a child in a regulated activity. Today, nothing has changed. Until it changes, there is going to be no improvement to child protection. Mandatory reporting is a, f is a vital component of a functioning child protection system, and we've got to have it. Okay. And the government um, gives the outcome of its consultation, consultation in December. Consultation in so December, will, yeah. and we'll they don't they want say. it. They don't want they it. They do not you want it. You know that before I the consultation has come out. Absolutely. Look at, just look at the bias in the cons consultation paper. Okay. They even omitted the most important piece of research that was published in April by Professor Ben Matthews of the Australian Institute of Technology, and it was a seven-year longitudinal study of a single jurisdiction and the effects of the introduction I'll of the I'll talk to the sports reporting. minister about this tomorrow okay. and see what she has to say. Right. right. But, but, you know, no, yeah. Football, football is doing what we're doing. We're <laughs> trying to help the Labour team take it incredibly seriously. Okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. And thanks to Peter and John as well. Thank you. Uh, we began the programme by talking to four footballers who courageously talked to you about the kind of abuse that they had suffered as young boys at the hands of their youth team coach. And so many of you have been 
moved by what they were able to say on national television that you've got in touch with us. And we're going to talk to Nick Johns now, who is in Plymouth. Now, Nick Johns was Steve Walter's former teacher. Uh, Paul Jacobs is in Kent. He's involved in football at a district level and has reported a coach in the past. Um, thank you very much for talking to us. As, as Steve Walter's former teacher, what would you want to say about the way Steve has spoken out this morning? Uh, hello, Victoria. Um, yes, I mean, it was very emotional for me to, uh, to see him and the other lads there talking as they did. You know, I've got a huge admiration for them. And uh, I remember Steve, uh, obviously, as a little lad, 11, 12, 13, and he went off to, uh, to, to soccer school to, in a sense, sort of bigger and better things. I think he's been extremely brave. Uh, along as have the others to speak out, uh, to, to speak out uh, as he has. I think uh, those of us who have the privilege and responsibility of either teaching or, or caring or coaching, uh, you know, coaching young people, coaching children, um, it, it is a, a huge responsibility, and uh, it is absolutely awful that these guys have, have done what they've done and others in other areas that we know know of too uh so steve you know very best wishes to you uh in the future i hope you can uh overcome the you know the difficulties you've had and all the other chaps there you yeah. know my heart goes out to you all paul um i wonder what impact it had on you watching them the four gentlemen talk this morning well you know watching that show this morning i really felt for those guys um you know, I, you can't imagine what those guys must have been going through. I had to report somebody 10 years ago uh, who was working with um, players. And um, fortunately, I had the support of my county FA and I had the support of, uh, you know, I'm a youth worker now. Mm -hmm. But at that time, I was a youth worker as well. And I had the support of my youth worker. Um, I was interviewed by detectives. Um, it went all the way to Soho Square, where the FA were based at the time. Fortunately, that man is no longer involved in football. Right. And briefly, Paul, how, how difficult or otherwise was that decision that you made to report that individual? And again, don't name any names. No, of course not. Uh, well, it was extremely difficult because, um, you know, he, he was a colleague, you know. Mm. And from what I saw uh, on a couple of occasions, um, I felt extremely uncomfortable. Um, fortunately, things have moved on and they've changed. Um, we now have uh, welfare officers, everybody has um, um, CRB checks and all the rest of it. And um, now, um, you know, I would never even go into a dressing room with players unless I had either parents or another manager with, an under manager yeah. with me. Thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much, Nick. Nick Johns, uh, Steve Alter's former teacher, Paul Jacobs, just two of our viewers who've got in touch today. So many of you have.